Let's get going. First, I want to thank everyone. It's not the most pleasant of conditions out there for, uh, for moving about town. So I, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Obviously, uh, September has arrived, and there has been a not insignificant build-up uh, surrounding September for what may or may not be uh, a consequential month uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian front with the UN General Assembly opening uh, later this month. What we have done is jumped at the opportunity uh, presented to us by friends, uh, especially from the Palestinian uh, Business Committee for Peace and Reform and uh, our friends Randa and, and George Salem who are here in the audience to uh, really take the entirety of a delegation that is spending a couple of days uh, in uh, Washington doing some meetings uh, as representatives of different parts of Palestinian civil society, including office holders uh, from the business community. Um, we have an advisor to the Palestinian team. I'm going to walk you through the entire delegation. A former ambassador, uh, Hindhori, is sitting next to me. Um, to, to take this group's presence in Washington and to put everyone up here on stage to run through some of the different aspects of what are the questions uh, on people's minds. And the way we're thinking to organize this is that I am um, going to pose a couple of questions to each of our panelists to start this discussion off, and then we can open it up for Q&A. The first thing I want to do before I jump into that um, and in welcoming you to NAF, to the America Strategy Program, and to this event of the Middle East Task Force, is use this opportunity to welcome my uh, new colleague and co-director of the task force <laughs> as of yesterday, um, Leila Hilal. Um, many of you would have um, known Amjad Atala, uh, who's actually in the audience, I think. There's a hand at the back. I assume it's attached to a, a body. Uh, Amjad has, uh, has moved on to, to Al Jazeera, where he is the Bureau Chief of Al Jazeera English for the Americas. Um, but we have, uh, we've upgraded Amjad. <laughs> and um, Layla is someone who I actually got to know in, in circumstances not dissimilar to those where I met Amjad, which was uh, when Layla um, was for many years an advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team, and Layla, who is uh, from here originally, from Michigan at least, uh, and who completed her studies here at the, in the US, uh, doing her LLM at uh, Harvard Law School, um, and has moved on uh, to several things, but the last number of years have been spent in the Middle East, where Layla was in Ramallah, and, uh, and afterwards in Amman, mostly, um, working as a strategic advisor to the UNRWA, their executive headquarters. Um, so I want to welcome you, uh, Layla, and I hope people, I hope people here will uh, get an opportunity to know Layla, and Layla's going to be part of this conversation, of course, and very much part of the day-to-day -day of the New America Middle East Task Force. Let me very quickly, and, and, I, and I apologize, but I am going to do this very quickly, run um, through who we have on the panel today. And I apologize, but I am going to do this from, I haven't committed everything to memory of the backgrounds of our panelists, and, and not everyone uh, I know that well. I'll start at this side of the table with Heba Husseini, who, who, who I do know from previous uh, encounters. Uh, Heba is the managing partner of Husseini and Husseini. Uh, a law firm based in the Palestinian territories uh, with a large domestic and clientele base. She has also uh, advised the negotiating teams in the past and uh, has been very much someone who has written background papers and policy papers and has followed this closely. Zahi Huri. Um, absolutely. Thank you, Kim. Uh, Zahi Huri is here also in his capacity with the Palestine Business Committee for Peace and Reform. Zahi is the president of the Palestinian Beverage Company. They're the Coca-Cola licenses. He's very much a leading figure in the Palestinian business community, serves on several boards, including that of Padico, for people who are familiar with the Palestinian economic scene. And he is actually a dual uh, 
uh, American citizen, and we might draw on uh, some of that when we get into the questions of how this might affect uh, the U.S. Moving on to Ambassador Hind Khoury. Uh, Ambassador Khoury was actually a member of the Palestinian Authority cabinet in the past, having responsibility for Jerusalem affairs, and after that was appointed as the ambassador of Palestine in France. She has an active background working with international development organizations and is active in Palestinian society, where she serves on the board of a number of local NGOs, including Arij, for people who know the uh, Arab Research Institute of Jerusalem, the Sabil, the Arab Thought Forum, and uh, I'm very pleased that we've got you here with us today, uh, Hind. So, next to Hind, we have Wasim Kazmo. Wasim actually only got in, was it this morning or late last night? Um, Wasim is a member of the uh, Negotiation Support Unit, which is the policy advice unit to the Palestinian negotiating team. He's worked closely with the president and with those leading the negotiations. And I think just recently uh, you completed uh, your master in public administration at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And you're uh, educated at SOAS in London. Um, Sorry? London and Harvard. The Reverend Mitri Raheb is uh, joining us from Bethlehem, where he is the pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Church there since 1988. He's an author and someone who has spoken on the Palestinian cause around the world, especially in Lutheran institutions for many years, and is very active in the NGO community, in his local community. And finally, and this is who I'm actually going to begin with when we now move on to the substance. Nafis Husseini is the VP uh, for digital business at CCC, Consolidated Contractors Company, one of the largest Palestinian companies, and again, someone who is uh, very active in the business community. And I'm going to start with your permission with you, Nafis. Last in, first out. <laughs> Sorry? Last in, first out. <laughs> Nafis, I don't think it's a coincidence that this is taking place in September at the culmination of what at least some of us have been following, which is this two-year state-building effort undertaken by the Palestinian leadership. And I think many people said, well, well how do you do state-building in the circumstances that you're in? Um, but it's something that the PA leadership, that the prime minister and the team have, uh, have really taken on board, and, and it's received rather high marks. But maybe you could tell us how you view what has been done uh, during those two years, where we're at today, and is it sustainable? What has to happen next? And I, obviously, I'm going to ask people to keep their answers to these questions relatively short. Just press on this. Right? Just press on the mute. And I, we are live streaming, and this will be up at NAF, so if people do speak to the mic. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, you asked about what happened in the last two years, uh, Daniel, and uh, uh, there has been a very disciplined approach to, approach to a very disciplined approach to uh, building uh, governance and institutions into the Palestinian fabric. And uh, uh, this has been consistently recognized by many assessments and conclusions by third parties. There's a, there's a, uh, there are great reports by the World Bank and the IMF recently that uh, really give uh, the PNA very high marks for this. Uh, how was this achieved? Well, the uh, state building program under the leadership of President Abbas and Premier Fayyad have given solid results. We have now uh, a good security framework, uh, uh, excellent uh, rule of law uh, governance structure, economic development that has uh, uh, displayed itself uh, through a 9.1% growth uh, in the GDP, and uh, a general improvement in the social services, particularly in health and in education. Now these are very, very concrete uh, achievements. Uh, but uh, this is only a seed and not the whole fruit. Uh, it really demonstrates that the existence, uh, uh, the existence of a great potential within the Palestinians to unleash uh, under this sound umbrella of uh, governance 
uh, a great uh, human story for statehood and for uh, being able to participate in the world as a full member. Uh, we still have a lot to do. And the next round of achievements uh, would be in the direction of making the economy and growth structured and sustainable. No doubt, the correct uh, application of international aid and sound governance over the years 2008 till 2010 have set the stage for this uh, very nice figure of 9.2% growth of GDP in 2010. Uh, in addition to this, you should note that there is a budget deficit that has been reduced from 1.8 billion in 2008 down to 1.3 in 2009, and it's just a little bit under 1 billion this last year in 2010. Now we have to make things more sustainable and wean the PNA further off aid. And how do we do this? And I'll offer some ideas as, uh, as uh, private sector. This is my role, I'm, uh, I'm in the private sector. They're not new ideas, but they're ideas that should be pursued uh, with more vigor. And for example, we should try to create leaner and higher quality government services programs through private partner partnerships and privatization perhaps in conjunction with loan guarantees and political risk insurance. People want to come and do business, but if they don't have loan guarantees and political risk insurance, they'd be very, very hesitant. The other thing is you have to know that uh, the Palestinians are very, very literate people. We're in the high 90s. We have an extensive pool of talent in Palestine. We have 45,000 university graduates annually. We should mine this and we should get uh, involved in some of the knowledge-based economies uh, and export services from there. And uh, uh, if the opportunity uh, comes, I'll give you examples of such things that we have done as a company. We should also encourage more SME involvement in targeting the manufacturing, excuse me, yes. If I can, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, just be because we, we are gonna be pushed for time with a big panel. And tell you what, what's going through my mind as I'm listening to, to, to the set of impressive achievements. I understand that you support the, uh, the, the likely action that the leadership will be taking at the United Nations. All Palestinians do, Daniel. Why would you want, as, a pri as someone here speaking from the private sector perspective, why would you want to put at risk? You know that while Palestinians may be supportive of the move, it's not. Congress is managing to curb its enthusiasm uh, when it comes to, uh, to Palestine's approach to the UN. And the Israelis apparently are also in the Larry David camp. Um, why would you put this at risk by taking this move right now at the UN? At the <coughs> Daniel, uh, are we expected to be any less human and uh, be uh, uh, measured by any less uh, uh, democratic uh, values and, uh, and principles than anyone else out there. Uh, our aspiration is not just for a good economic prosperity. Our aspiration is for freedom, for statehood, for showing the world what we can do as a nation. The Palestinians are known to be the builders of the Arab Gulf, and we'd like to build our own homes as well. It is time. We are ready for statehood. Thank you. I, I, I th thank you, Nafez, and, and I'm sure we're going to drill deeper into some of those issues of what the ramifications might be uh, of this move. But, but why don't we go for the jugular and go to the opposite end of the table uh, in terms of this UN move? And, and I'm going to ask you, Heba, to just spell it out there for us. What uh, and uh, yeah, let, let me give it some context. The group here, uh, stating the obvious, are here partly as advocates of what the leadership is, is, is taking to the, the UN, uh, taking to New York this month. So I want to ask you, Heba, what is the leadership trying to do at the UN? Okay. Uh, thank you. It's good to be here with you all, and thanks for this critical question. 
Um, I would say the leadership uh, and the Palestinian people who support this move uh, have tried negotiations for over 20 years. We have been in conflict for over 60 years. And uh, we, are, we have reached a moment in time when we are so ready as a country, because we, are, we have all the attributes of statehood, to seek the UN and to seek our bid to the UN. Why are we doing it? It's not because we do not believe in negotiations. Negotiations continue to remain and be our first choice. So going to the UN is not our first choice. And also, it is not our last resort. It is not the last. We are still looking for the opportunity to resume negotiations. We, we accept the American and, of course, the Israeli premise that a negotiated agreement is the approach to resolving this conflict. However, time is not on our side. And with the facts on the ground that many of you are familiar with, and the pl as such as the settlements, the borders, the plight of the refugees in domestically in the Pal Palestinian territories and in, in the host Arab countries, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. I mean, we've seen recently how the Palestinian refugees in the Syrian camp just innocently were subjected to, you know, killing because the, the, the Syrians are revolting the, against their own government. I mean, they just happen to be at the wrong place. So the, these are the factors that the Palestinian leadership considers and could they continue to weigh on it. So in spite of the success story in the West Bank, Gaza is no, uh, not a success story. Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, from our perspective, is not a success story. So here we are formulating a new alternative. It is the least confrontational alternative from our perspective. It is, it's a legal means to a legal end. Our, our principal objective is to reach that sovereign state where we achieve our freedom that we have been espousing for for so long, like everybody else in the world. You know, we've seen South Sudan recently, you know, seeking their freedom and... But, but what, what are you trying to get from the UN? Do you, are you trying to become a member state of the UN, which you know America can and will veto? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to upgrade Palestine status to, a, to not being a member, but being an observer state? Mm -hmm. If you can, give us a little insight into what you understand the, the, the aim to be. My understanding is that those are two options. Uh, and being a, an, an outsider, only an advisor, I am not a decision maker. I am not a political decision what maker. What advice would you give? Uh, and share with this room if you're willing to. Uh, as an advisor, I have put the two options on the table. I provided the pros and the cons, and I leave the political decision to the leadership. The leadership is entertaining both the membership and the recognition, and therefore, um, the, the, it is their decision ultimately to make the right decision for the, for the Palestinians that serves the interests of the Palestinian people, for the reasons I cited. I'm going to take another can try. Go. You can try. I'm going to try, and, 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 try. And, and extract from you what might have been in uh, that advice that you would have given, that, those pros and cons. What are the, if you want to have a go, at what is the pro of going for membership when mm -hmm. it is unattainable? I invite you to address that because the American veto, I think, is, is not up for question. But I, I, it might be more interesting to, to hear what is the advantages as you see them of, of what is attainable, which is this non-member state status? Well, as, again, as a legal advisor to the leadership, uh, when we give opinion, uh, it is an analysis. And therefore, as I said, again, uh, they make the decision. I cannot, in my advice, um, give them the decision. The veto, the US veto, would be one of the different ad advantages or disadvantages that I would list. Um, in, in going to the UN, uh, membership gives us, obviously, much more enhanced status than non-member state, but also non-member state has a lot of advantages for us, uh, among which includes uh, membership in international conventions, 
uh, upgrading, obviously, the diplomatic relations between Palestine as a state of Palestine and its uh, partner states and so forth and so on. So there are a lot of positive advantages to, to both. And obviously, uh, uh, membership gives you greater such advantages how the U.S. elects to make a decision on how to exercise its prerogative of veto is certainly not an issue that I would give advice on. I'm going to continue down this path with the other person we have here who wears that hat of, uh, of providing counsel and legal counsel and advice to the leadership. And, and let's say one gets something at the U.N. later this month, Wasim, Walk us through, from your perspective, how that helps us get from where we are today to the goal of a Palestinian, sovereign, viable, actual, not under occupation state. Um, I have uh, actually a very direct answer for that. Um, I mean, the Palestinian um, leadership and the Palestinian people have been engaged into this process of uh, the peace process or the negotiation process for the past uh, uh, 20 years now. And uh, we ended up um, recently still discussing what are we discussing. Are we discussing really uh, the end of the uh, Israeli occupation? Are we discussing uh, a two-state solution based on the uh, 67 line? Or we are discussing something totally uh, different? Um, with this current uh, Israeli government, uh, it's the latter. We are uh, probably uh, discussing something that is not really the contours of the principles uh, uh, of that started the peace process as such, which is the, the end of the Israeli occupation and the creation of the Palestinian uh, state over the West Bank and, 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 and Gaza Strip. And I, I don't know how close to the room you were, but if we could go on a small detour, um, it's the anniversary now. Well, it's not exactly an anniversary to be celebrated of the reconvening of negotiations last September. Um, I think it was the longest ever build-up. It's okay. I think it was the longest ever build-up to the shortest ever negotiations. But there were negotiations, albeit I think three meetings maybe between. Is there any anything well, that you the, picked the, up that you could yeah. share with us of what the, happened in those well, negotiations? These negotiations uh, couldn't really continue because uh, the basis of these negotiations were not actually uh, uh, clear. So for us, I think going to to uh, the, our UN bit would uh, end the story of uh, whether the um, Occupied territory are disputed territory. Uh, whether the uh, end game is actually uh, the establishment uh, of a Palestinian, a viable Palestinian uh, state, or, or or not, and I think that discussion will will, will end, and uh, will be actually engaging with the with the Israelis on how to end their their occupation, the the timetable maybe, uh, more than uh, whether they will end it or uh, or not. We don't want to go into endless discussion with the Israeli government whether we deserve. Uh, uh, rights that have been given uh, given to us by the international law and the international uh, community. That's not really up to the uh, negotiations. We are not ne negotiating our rights. We are actually uh, talking how we want to implement these uh, uh, these rights. Let's put ourselves 30, 45, whatever it is, days from now. And let's say there has been some achievement of note at the United Nations, whether in a purely theoretical world membership, ain't gonna happen, or some other resolution which enhances the status, wins strong international support. From a political negotiator's advisor perspective, what's new? Where where are we the morning after? What's your plan to the extent to which you can share it with us for the morning after? You know, some Palestinian leaders have been asked what's after September, and they gave, you know, it's October and October and, and, and November. And this is actually the case. I mean, the Palestinians will continue to engage into uh, enforcing uh, uh, their legitimate rights and implementing their legitimate rights by all means, legal, legal means. And I think the, uh, uh, our move in the UN is actually a start of uh, a whole list of uh, different uh, moves that we will be uh, making in order to ensure 
that uh, uh, the two-state solution will be implemented and to consolidate the two-state solution. I think this is the perspective of the, uh, of the uh, uh, Palestinian leadership. And then we want to, to, to see whether we're actually heading that direction or not. Um, we would love to, to, to have a, a, a viable, independent Palestinian state. Uh, we would love to uh, uh, end uh, and uh, solve the uh, issue of the refugees, the issue of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem, uh, uh, the, set the settlements. But we cannot really continue endlessly trying just to negotiate whether we want to negotiate or not. I would love to play for Arsenal Football Club, but um, I'm not doing much that's practically advancing that. You're going to the UN to practically advance this. Can you share with us, of that list, you said there's a list of things. Can you give us a taste, a couple of dishes that are on that list? What are, the, what are specific things that, that, that this UN move might give you? As I tried to explain, maybe it wasn't really clear. For us, the um, terms of reference of the uh, negotiation okay. will, be, will be quite quite clear. We would hope that we would also find a credible uh, 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 Israeli partner that will sit, us, uh, sit with us on the negotiating table to actually... But the UN doesn't change that one way or the other. The UN will enforce the vision of the two-state solution, will consolidate the, uh, the, the vision of the two-state solution, which is actually being totally uh, uh, um, um, demolished by, by all of the Israeli facts on the ground uh, uh, policies. And also not only the facts on the ground policies, but also the vision of the current Israeli uh, uh, leaders. We don't want to take both peoples to, uh, to an area where we don't want really to, uh, uh, to, to head. We think our move will consolidate our position in, in that regard. Would, would actually uh, uh, put, uh, uh, give incentives to in the international community and also to Israel to actually move in that direction. I'm sure those are things we'll come back to again, um, but, 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 but thank you. I want to, having zoomed in narrowly to the UN, I want to zoom out much more. Um, you work every day with, with members of your, your community, Reverend Raheb. And we're obviously witnessing very uplifting, dangerous but uplifting and dramatic times in the region. How does the Palestinian reality of today and also the Palestinian UN move fit in with what we're seeing in the region? How does it interact with that? What are you feeling from, from on the ground in Bethlehem? Uh, I think it fits very well because uh, what's happening actually in the Arab world and in Palestine, it's really all about people who want to live in dignity, in freedom, and who would like to reach their potentials. This is what it's all about. And let me, I mean, just give you myself as an example. I mean, I was born 1962, five years later, Israel occupied the West Bank, Gaza Strip, Jerusalem, including Bethlehem. In 88, the PLO decided to go for a two-state solution. And we have been hearing about the two states now for a long time. I mean, I spent almost my whole life, you know, hearing two states, two states. Isn't it high time now to finally say the time has come for the Palestinians to get really their state, to be able to live in dignity, uh, to be able to, li to live in freedom. I mean, I'm really worried that maybe my daughters, I have two daughters, would they still keep hearing two states and on the ground will be something else? So I think the new generation of the Middle East are saying, now is the time. Uh, and it's like a new page. It's like opening a new page in the Middle East. And I think this momentum, uh, we really need to, gra to, to grab it. Uh, uh, because it could be really the opening of, of a new era in the Middle East. And it starts with Palestine. I'm, I'm tempted to ask you where you go with what is implicit in that message which is, and what if not? And uh, I, I'd invite you to, to speak to that. But I also want to, in that reality, do, do people look to the events of New York and say, this can give me hope? Is, is, 
is that something you feel um, given the decades of, as you've described it of frustration? I think uh, people in Palestine um, are, are smart. They know what to expect and what not to expect from the UN. I think what they expect is that this is a very important step mm. forward. Uh, and this is, a, uh, this is a very important sign of hope because uh, they want to see actually if the international community is paying them only lip service or are they serious about what they say. And in that sense, I think we should not underestimate this step. However, we should not, I think, overestimate it because people know that, you know, on the ground, things will still be different. But I think they will depict that, that, that moment that, yes, the international community is serious and they are ready to back them, to get them there, to reach their potential. What I'm hearing is that there is a, understandably, a close relationship between a Palestinian ability to sustain belief in two states and an endorsement of that from the world. Correct. Uh, we're going to talk about America more in a moment, but where does America fit into that? Uh, Palestinians, I think, you know, seem to have a close relationship with, with, with American culture, but how are they going to relate to the likely, not for the first time, of course, uh, but in a, a very s significant setting, given the build-up? To, to, to America's approach to the U.S.? You know, I think what we are asking for, actually, is just all the things that this great country was established on. Talk about liberty, about freedom, about uh, democracy, about uh, um, uh, free market. I mean, all of these kinds of things. It, I mean, I always, when I go to the Hill, I tell uh, people there, I mean, please, please, please come and implement the American values in Palestine. This is what you are asking for. And in that sense, I think, we, are, we should be both on the, on the same page. Uh, uh, and it is really the great American values that, uh, that, uh, that I think can open all of these potentials in the Middle East. I, I want to kind of continue in this line with you, Ambassador Khoury, which is how does it how does it feel back home uh and how does one kind of place what might or might not happen in new york to to what might or might not manifest itself on the ground how how do you whether now or in a month's time after whatever happens in new york um continue to pursue statehood under the conditions where there is still an occupation there is 60% of the West Bank territory out of reach, etc. Um, give us a sense of, of, of how you move forward in the face of that reality. Well, um, it is clear that under the present circumstances, we can't move further ahead. Uh, and, and we have done a lot, as, as some of my colleagues have already explained, except, uh, and I'm not only the only one to say it, I mean, look at World Bank reports, IMF, we cannot improve the economy if we still have all these 600 checkpoints and the wall and the uh, difficulties of access and movement, etc. cetera. Um, we can't have elections. I mean, Palestinians basically are quite a democratic country. And believe me, I can speak uh, much more freely than many others in the region, except that we're not able to hold elections. Uh, we are cantonized. Uh, political situation is getting much more complicated. And we need to be able to get out of this impasse. Uh, we want a sustainable economy. Again, we can't have it. We've had nine point something growth uh, in 2010, <laughs> which is a great thing. Except we know that uh, income from agriculture went 50% down. Uh, since uh, the beginning of this decade. Uh, the same goes for manufacturing. I mean, these are issues Americans can identify with. We need to be able to 
move ahead with a population that is literate, that knows, we have a very uh, capable diaspora, uh, and then, so we need to get over the hurdles that do not allow us to be a state, to be a people with a future. Uh, we also need international law. I mean, you know, we've spoken, we've exploded trying to explain to people this scenario where our daily rights, most basic rights, are violated in such a flagrant manner is not a status quo we can live with or the world can accept. And yet it did go on. And for years we explained. So I think going to the UN is not only a source of hope, but it gives us the tools to be able to, to improve our negotiating position, uh, get better socioeconomic diplomatic tools uh, to move ahead, and, and to provide perhaps, if necessary, and I think it is necessary, a deterrent whereby Israel behaves as a member of this community of nations. Um, so I, uh, all we're seeking is freedom, and I hope that this next step will enable us to move ahead and get over the limitations the state score is providing. Maybe we'll just, maybe we'll pick up on the deterrent thing later. Where I, I wanted to go with it is, one of the claims one hears here, um, Hind, is how this might impact the security environment. And, and, and I think uh, Reverend Rahab began to touch on that. Mm -hmm. um, we are told every day, I think, by, by, by certain spokespeople that this could encourage violence, it's going to create expectations, dash them, and, and you know, the next round of bloodshed is around the corner, and it's your fault yeah. because you're encouraging it by going to the UN. I am, I, to be honest with you, I'm surprised at this logic because I think that it's the status quo that is providing the threat of, uh, of going back to violence, and it can't go on. What going to the end will do is actually contribute to a fruitful peace process and minimize the threat of violence. So, it, and look at what, what we've done in terms of security. We've established a very good security infrastructure. And the Palestinian National Authority has managed under very difficult times. I mean, remember, after the aggression against Gaza in 2009, they managed to control the streets, even against their own, uh, let's say, credibility with the streets, in a sense. But still, they do it because we know strategically this is extremely important. However, if the ongoing impasse and the ongoing violations of human rights continue, how long will they be able to sustain that kind of security infrastructure to, to, to maintain it as efficient? Uh, I think it, we risk having it collapse. Uh, so, no, and, and, and security is extremely important for Palestinians and everybody else in the region, and my hope is we'll be able to change the, the game whereby law and the rule of law means something, that everybody applies the rule of law. I mean, that's what we, we're all seeking. You, you mentioned Gaza and, 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 and the, the events of uh, almost three years ago now. Uh, in your comments, where, where does Gaza fit into this picture? Where does the attempt at reconciliation, mm -hmm. uh, national reconciliation signed in May, uh, fit into this picture? Are these kind of two parallel trains that never meet? The UN effort, the political effort, no. and the unity effort? Or is there, is there a relationship between them? Oh, I, well, for us, it is certainly part of the plan. I mean, one of our uh, priorities is to finish with the seat of Gaza. I mean, that's not a situation we can accept or live with. And it has been going on for too long. And our hope is it's after September. We signed the reconciliation, anyhow. Truly, there are some hurdles. But we hope that after September, the, the clarity of the vision of where we can be heading the, 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 the improvement in our negotiating position will allow us to replicate the, 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 the model that we have succeeded in the West Bank to Gaza uh, and will help us go ahead with the reconciliation, which is a priority number one of the Palestinian people anyway, that we can't ignore. I mean, the streets have become more important. That also applies to, to the Palestinian leadership, whereby their decisions now should be much more sensitive to the street. And the street is saying, time and again, first, we need reconciliation. So I, I think, no, after September, we will be certainly better off in uh, bringing all the parties closer together in terms of political program, but also in terms of, uh, of unity and uh, geographic unity. I, 
I'm going to kind of switch tracks and, 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 and turn to our last guest and, and, and turn to you, Zahi. And what I want to focus on with you is something we just briefly skirted earlier, which is, uh, first of all, the Palestinians' relationship with the U.S. Um, this is being described by some as a very ill-advised move in terms of uh, Palestinian-U.S. relations. Um, why, why put those relations at risk, Zahi? You know, I haven't heard a word since we sat here about the international community responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the conflict. I mean, you bear a huge responsibility when it comes to this uh, conflict. And, and I think uh, in the U.S. relationship, I tell you the relationship between, I want to differentiate between the Palestinian people and the American people as one, and between the American leadership and the Palestinian political leadership as something else. There are two different tracks there. I think we, sh we, I consider this to be today a cloud. If we were, if today we were January 2013, I think we would be talking a totally different language. And I think the depth of the relationship does not equate with the relationship, say, with the, uh, with, uh, as we like to call them in the Middle East, with our cousins, you know. Uh, but uh, I think today the world has changed. We're, we're, we're out of the fixed line era. We're now in a totally different era. And I think we, we haven't touched on that, but let me tell you that once you get uh, the uh, uh, the technology of communication, which goes above the heads of everybody, literally, I think we are going to be seeing a different world. The Israelis today have their own Isra Israeli summer, not spring. And if you look at it, you will see a lot of comparison with the Arab Spring. Now, to go back uh, to your question, I mean, uh, what I noticed here that in a way Was Washington is, is basically shivering or in a total panic about what the Palestinians are asking for. I mean, I was, my expectation would have been that the United States would be the champion of our call, not the other way around. But uh, nevertheless, I'm not because. as, because I think this is what, what the U.S. stands for. Because of the promises, don't forget what the president said at the U.N. General Assembly. Don't forget the commitments, and I go back to the responsibility of the United States in its various policy statements which has never been implemented, by the way. And, and this is why I think, uh, I like to think that we are, we have a very heavy cloud over us. It's more in Washington than it is in Palestine, actually. And it, uh, it, will, uh, it, uh, it will pass. Uh, and let's not also think that the last, uh, word has been said on this. I think we should have this discussions maybe two hours after midnight on September 19th, because there's still a lot going on. There's a lot of discussion, and and I think there are always spoilers in in a relationship like that. And and I'm not sure the pl if the spoilers are gaining anything. This is really the irony of this whole. L let me talk about 
or ask you to talk about um, similar considerations, but with regard to Israel. I mean, some make the point you could get 192 of the 193 UN member states to support you, but if number 193 that's holding out is Israel, then the occupation is still going to be in place. Is there a, a concern that this does significant, irreparable even, damage to your ability to work in the future with the Israelis, with those who need to be convinced to, uh, to uh, go somewhere else in terms of letting there be a Palestinian state? You know, uh, I have to speak here, maybe it will shock some, in the defense of Israel on this. I think Israel today the long-term thinker and the, who are really thinking about the existential uh, uh, future of Israel don't share the views of the present leadership. We are a lot in touch with the public, with the civil society, and the, we have a lot more in common with them than meets the eye here, actually. And we're working on that. I think the present... Uh, uh, Israel will recognize through internal transformation within the Israeli uh, society that what is happening today is not in the interest of Israel. What is happening, if I want to take one thinking that we look at all, I, I can say the brilliant Palestinians are leaving, you're going to have Somalia as a neighbor. Is this what Israel wants? I doubt it. Do, do, does the prospect of, um, and, and you know it's been talked about it very openly and, and, uh, and has appeared in the press, does the prospect of Israeli retaliatory measures in response to the very act of, uh, of uh, being so uppity as to go to the United Nations, um, is that something that poses a serious concern um, for you, even also retaliatory measures, congressionally led one would imagine, uh, by the US when it comes to, to aid? Uh, on the aid, you know, I consider this really a US affair and, 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 and money I realize is important. Uh, and when we talk about aid, I mean, it's good to talk about a small detail in that aid what really is approved on the hill, the dollar approved on the hill, 30 cents of it reaches the Palestinian people. I mean, let's be very clear about that. And there are some congressmen who are, who are extremely upset about it. They don't want to cut the aid. They want to cut the overheads. You see? I mean, this is something, when we talk about something, we, know we ought to be a little bit, I think, more knowledgeable. Uh, the reality is, the losers of cutting the foreign aid are going to be mostly Washington subcontractors. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, for that reason alone, should you not withdraw your UN bid? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> the last thing we think about, you know, you can't buy dignity, you cannot buy freedom. Full stop. This is really the point. But in terms of uh, Israel, you know, there's something much stronger than Mr than an Israeli political leadership. There is something called economy. There is something called West Bank being a, and Gaza being a captive market. It's a $4 billion market. And that the Israeli private sector is not going to keep to be quiet about it. So the retaliatory aspect of it, I don't really uh, expect it, especially, and this wasn't mentioned so far, that President Abbas is committed, and I think the word is convinced that strategically he is totally against any violent uh, demonstration or any, viol any violence, full stop. So this is why it gives me uh, some encouragement that uh, Israel, as said someone a few days ago, is having a tantrum about it. Washington is in panic, but trust me, uh, business will continue uh, even after the declaration. But what will it do, really? 
in my opinion, we will be in a better environment to start serious negotiations. A message of chill out from the Coca-Cola man. Chill out. What I... But thank you, Zahi, for, for that. Um, what I'm going to do, and I, and I appreciate the insight and the brevity and the ability to work through that uh, of all the panelists. Um, and what I want to do, though, is, is uh, open it out for conversations. Jonathan and Tom, uh, if, if you could, we, they're right there next to you, Jonathan, Kim. And if you could introduce yourself, Kim. Hi, uh, I'm Kim Rattas. We, we, we need to... I think there's a mute button that just needs to be pressed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is it on? Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you mind standing? Sure. Thanks. Uh, Kim Rattas with the BBC. Um, I have a question for any of the members of the panel. Um, I'm curious to, to know whether Palestinians understand why the United States will veto uh, your bid for statehood, or is it something that is just incomprehensible for most Palestinians? I, I th for, for now at least, we'll take one question at a time. We may batch them later, and I'm going to ask whoever wants to jump in, but I'm going to ask you to stick to Kim's question, which is answer on the assumption that it's a veto, because it's a very fair assumption. Yeah. Do you want to... Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to take, I'll, I'll have Zahi and Hind comment on that, unless anyone else is chomping at the bit. Zahi. The uh, uh, Palestinians understand that very well. Even the kids in kindergarten. <laughs> Trust me, they understand this very well. And they know that there are uh, politics. Uh, we are become, I mean, there's so many theses written about Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's a domestic issue. But you know, America is stronger than that. And eventually we will be de-domesticated. I think it's a question of confidence. Palestinians do understand what the US is saying. But then they've heard so many confusing messages, so many promises, and nothing came out of it. And now we need to change the game. I mean, enough is enough. We, we don't believe in anybody. Uh, we know that the, 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 the existing paradigm will not be able to take us further, neither on negotiations, neither in the situation on the ground, meaning uh, the, the difficulties of daily life. So we need to move ahead and, and change the game whereby international law is respected, is functioned into the, the paradigm or, or so the, the peace process, a renewed peace process. Uh, and, and that's why you see a certain kind of, uh, you know, people are adamant. They want to see this change. Uh, people are for going to the UN. You know, the polls say two thirds are for really going to the UN. The president's popularity has increased because they see that finally that, that game has sort of to speak, have been used. It reached the end of the line. We need to get to some change and, and move ahead. Let's bring the mic down to the front. I actually might collect some questions. I think it might be more effective given. We'll, we'll take your question here, and then I've got two in the front row, and then I'll come to that side. Hi, my name is Maya Yurowski. I'm from J Street. Um, I live in Jerusalem, and I wanted to know a little bit more about, it's kind of maybe a silly question, but, um, you know, Israel. We're going to hold you to it now. <laughs> In 1948, Israel gained their statehood from the UN um, vote and the support of the United States. So what does Palestine, how, how do the Palestinians feel about this sort of comparison between their, their moment to shine and Israel's moment to shine, even though you know, they went to the UN, they were against all odds, kind of just very similar to the state the Palestinians are in now? Uh, Jonathan Broder from Congressional Quarterly. I'd like to return to um, a question that uh, Daniel mentioned, and that is the prospect of losing hundreds of million dollars of uh, U.S. aid. Uh, Israel's uh, supporters on Capitol Hill have made it very, very clear that if this uh, U.N. strategy goes through, they will cut aid. And um, I know that that aid is quite important to the Palestinian Authority. How would you manage without it? Um, have you thought this through? 
and then just land them. Please. It's okay. My name is Landrum Bolding. Uh, I got involved in the study of this problem uh, 40 years ago. I was, wrote a little book uh, under the sponsorship of the Quakers called Searching for Peace in the Middle East, which got me launched into a lifelong <laughs> struggle. Uh, that little book and other things that I've written and spoken about over the years has supported strongly the two-state solution. But I want to ask reaction to a statement I'd like to make at this point. Uh, admittedly very provocative. I have come to the, convention to, to the conviction that the two-state solution is not a possibility. There's no way it's going to happen. The Israelis have made this impossible. The whole program of developing the settlements was, above everything else, designed to make it impossible. I'm just going back and reading some of the uh, statements going back to Ben-Gurion through Begin. The Israeli inter establishment has from the beginning expected, wanted to hold all the land between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley. They have it now. There's no indication that they have any desire to give it up. Uh, what, fear, what I fear is that the Israelis uh, could very, uh, the Israeli people want a settlement. I'm sure they would accept a two state solution, but the inter establishment does not. My feeling is that the only hope for a solution to this problem is to go back to UN Resolution 181, which I've just reread recently. You know what the title of that resolution is? Partition with Economic Union. And the resolution spells out how the two states coming into being were to be linked together and all, a whole list of detailed interrelationship. The word federation is never used. But what was created, what was in the minds of the people who approved the resolution that provided for the creation of the State of Israel was a kind of federal union. And why could this not be revived? This to me would be the kind of solution that would work for both sides. But I think the two, the two state solution is finished. And I'd like to know what the reaction of the <coughs> panel is to that. Landrum, thank you for that. And one should also acknowledge your modesty and, and all the years that you were shuttling and sometimes in a somewhat more semi-official role uh, trying to ad, uh, advance peace and it's fascinating to hear uh, the conclusion that you've drawn which I understand is a relatively recent vintage. Um, who, so we've got three questions on the table, a response to Landrum's comment going deeper on the issue of uh, US aid and how does this sit for Palestinians as a comparison to 1948 at the UN. Um, I'm open to whoever captures my attention. I'll answer very quickly the question here. Yes, there are plans to, uh, I mean, budgetary planning, taking into consideration the cutting of the foreign aid. Uh, I, I can't talk too much about it, but I, I can tell you if we manage better our very fragile borders in terms of imports and so on, if we manage better our tax situation domestically, I think we'll compensate for more than that. But I think the political significance of that cutting aid is something I'm not very comfortable with, and I don't like. That's uh, the money. Uh, uh, I mean, this was a, a bit too... Uh, too much for the country like the United States to use blackmailing tactic to get political advantages. It's not the United States I would like to see. Can Thank you. Very, very well, Do you have budgets you can. Uh, from any of the wealthy Arab countries to make up for that need? There, we, we're working, uh, there are commitments which haven't been paid yet but it, it, it's coming, it's also, again, a, a political issue. It's not the, co the lack of funding on the Arab state. I hope that once we have also the reconciliation, mm -hmm. the money will be flowing mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'll start with Hind. Yeah. I, uh, I would like to answer the, the question of the lady. That was not a stupid question. It's a very important question because what we hope to achieve is some kind of 
of equity in dealing with people. We sometimes feel we're treated like we're not human enough. And believe me, that's very painful to live with. Uh, because, um, and we understand it this way, that the establishment of the State of Israel and its leg legitimacy is equal to the establishment of the State of Palestine. And we don't understand all these obstacles, all this panic, all this, uh, uh, you know, diplomacy that, you know, sort of makes you get lost in a quagmire. Uh, we, we need to move ahead. And allow me to speak, it's not very diplomatic to say, we've heard a very Hippocratic language for too long from part of the international community. And, uh, and we've heard it for too long. I think it's time that it stops. Uh, I have to admit that there is a civil society that is very, not only in Israel and in Palestine, but also around the world that understood the issues and have this human agenda and are there, they're picking the good fight and doing a very good job. On the issue of, um, of aid, I think Zahi was very, very uh, articulate. Uh, I just want to add that it will be difficult when we have less aid. But believe me, I was in government in 2005, and every month, and Hamas wasn't on the scene. It was before the elections. And every month, the struggle was, how do we get the money to pay the salaries? And believe me, no Palestinian want to stay hostage to this kind of scenario. It's time we, we move ahead. We have been hostages. Actually, this kind of blackmailing, again, I'm not being diplomatic here. We need to move ahead and, and not be hostage. On the issue of what Israel wants, again, it's very clear. I think the writing is all over the wall. Um, and, and perhaps after a stage of of statehood, of some kind of independence. We can move to a federation. It makes a lot more sense, actually. You know, the historic Palestine will always be our country, and the Jews will all going to say, this is our country. It's going to be shared. So it need, we need open borders. We need cooperation in any form that, that will be feasible, and I hope this is the, w the way we will go. Thank you. Maybe Londrum, just directly to answer whether the two-state solution is dead or not. And uh, I think this is the answer that uh, uh, Israel and the international community should spell it out. I mean, for us Palestinians, we have uh, tried it uh, all, as, as this is our narrative. Uh, in the 60s, we were calling for a binational state, and everybody uh, refused that. And in 1988, we uh, uh, accepted uh, uh, um, to, uh, to concede to 78% of historic Palestine in order to be able to establish our own viable Palestinian state. And till now we are really actually suffering to, uh, to bring that uh, to, to, to practice. So it's actually a question to the international community. Are they really interested in the two-state solution? And uh, if they are, and also uh, Israel, it's time to implement it. And everybody knows what the two-state solution uh, is all about. It's about having Israel and Palestine Palestine on the uh, uh, on the West Bank and Gaza Strip with, with East Jerusalem as, as its capital. Uh, um, now the kind of relationship between Israel and Palestine, it's uh, something to be negotiated between, between the, uh, the, the parties. But I think time is, is of an essence. And I think that uh, uh, with the continued Israeli policies, yes, big challenges are being put onto the entire premise of the two-state solution. But it's not really the Palestinians that need to uh, um, answer this question. It's, um, it's our partners on the, on the other side, and also the international community who has been pushing us towards accepting this uh, international uh, uh, concept. And you know, we've heard about uh, the Bush vision, now we are hearing about the Obama hope, and I hope that uh, somebody will come actually and um, uh, practice it. If we're going back to the, if we come down the front while Jonathan's walking down, I, one thing that just strikes me as we're having this conversation, especially follow up for the question you asked, Jonathan, is um, what I'm hearing from the platform, and I think it would not be too different if we had currently serving Palestinian officials here, this is not a revolutionary move in terms of its intentionality that the Palestinian leadership is seeking to make at the UN. This is something of an incrementalist move, which is born of the inability to make progress with negotiations, but it's designed to still be in that place of trying to advance in a negotiated way with international support a two-state solution. It strikes me that the radical game-changing potential of this move, the revolutionary potential of this move, exists much more in Congress and in the Israeli cabinet. And only if Congress and the Israeli government choose 
to respond in a revolutionary way or in a radical way to the move, to cut aid, to withhold tax revenues, to take dramatic moves, only then, I think, will we see the whole thing unravel. And, and a very hesitant Palestinian step, I mean, what we're, we're hearing on the platform is the center cannot hold indefinitely. This is buying time for the center to hold from a Palestinian perspective. <clears throat> but should others take a pickaxe to this very fragile sh sheet of ice, then we're in a whole different paradigm, is my sense. But I, we've got Marianne here, and then next to Marianne on the end of that row. I'm Marianne Stein, a former chair of Americans for Peace Now and a longtime advocate and fighter for the two-state solution. Um, can people hear? Uh, can you? Can you okay. I'm, I'm Marianne Stein, a former chair of Sorry, Americans for Peace Now and a believer in the two-state solution. Um, however, I'm concerned that in this conversation, I feel as if, um, to some extent, short shrift is given to the, some of the um, concerns, some which may be legitimate, um, about this, this particular action. And um, the one that I have heard that seems to me to be quite real is about the relationship between Gaza and the West Bank or between Hamas and Fatah. And whether, um, Daniel, you started on that path, I think, in your last comment, if, um, if this didn't go through, that the actions of the United States in, in killing it or the Congress in cutting off aid um, could create a situation where the current leadership loses or the center loses its hold on, um, on the politics in Palestine. But I think um, there are also concerns that if this goes forward, um, there is the potential for plenty of mischief um, to occur. And I'm curious to know what concerns you may have about um, this very fragile, um, I don't remember what the term is, reconciliation, coming together, uh, whatever it is. It's been very hard in coming, and um, there are many people who are quite concerned about what will, what will happen um, to this entity that it, at the moment is so, so fractured. And then, thank you, Mary. No, that's, sorry. Yeah, that's <laughs> sorry. Hi, um, my name is Faris. I'm a Jordanian and Palestinian living here in DC. Um, there's been sure. quite close. Sure. There's been a lot of um, vague reports about the Jordanian position on this move. Um, have there been any consultations with the Jordanians about this? Do they have anything to be concerned about? And can you assure us that they are supportive of this move? Um, do you have anything to say about these reports? Thank you, Faris. We're going to take Michelle then. Hi, Michelle Kellerman with National Public Radio. I just wondered um, what your view is on President Obama right now on his, uh, and on what he's doing, the team that he sent to talk to Abbas, uh, David Hale and Dennis Ross. Yes, we can. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn back to the panel and then we'll have a, a, a last round, I think. On the Jordanian, very yeah. easy one. Uh, on the Jordanian, Palestine, it's, it's, it's the easiest question so because there have been, I would say, almost every other day consultation between the president and King Abdullah. And, and all the all declaration and what we see first, the chemistry between both is excellent. At the second level, the government thinks uh, they're on the same wavelength. There are, I mean, some people who are con concerned about the Jordanianism, but I think this will be overcome. But at the top level, the very, very close coordination. Uh, I'll take Please, Hiba. Yeah. Just for a minute. Yeah, the Hamas Fatah uh, question. Uh, True, the reconciliation agreement has 
been or t took long in the making, but finally it was reached in May. And um, in, in that respect, uh, it has gained the support of all Palestinians. Going to the UN further supports that reconciliation. M not going to the UN undermines that reconciliation. Hamas has issued a declaration uh, that, it has, that it supports the step of going to the UN. So in that context, it brings us closer together. And the Obama. Yes, yes. Any on Obama. Yes, Obama. He's the president. Yeah. Uh, Miss NPR, you yes. you asked yes. what again? Right now, you know, his polls are down in the Middle East and in the U.S. <laughs> but you know. I still would like to think this a cloud. I think he has to survive first before he can be thinking of us Palestinians, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, President Obama, at least I personally feel that he is, as a person, he is fully committed, he understands the issue. And, and when he visited Jerusalem, as a young senator, I was very surprised about the depth of his knowledge after having met probably 20 senators and congressmen over the last few years. I was very, very surprised, pleasantly surprised about the depth of his knowledge. But he, was, he wasn't a candidate yet. So uh, I'm optimistic I'm about him. And I don't look at what happens uh, this month or the previous month. I'll try to think a little bit longer term, you know. Maybe January 3rd or 4th, 2013, will be a different Obama. So the inverse relationship implied between one's depth of knowledge and closeness to the presidency. Um, <laughs> yes, it goes back. Or length of time <laughs> in the presidency. I, I, I think, in, and if anyone wants to comment also on the team that's... Uh, was also asking the team that's in the region right now, uh, um, Which? David Hayer and um, Thomas Ross. Yeah, just very briefly, I want to answer on the, on the Gaza thing and the reconciliation, because I spoke about it earlier. Uh, and I think we will be better off after September. The whole idea that September will open up, will provide Palestinians with a clearer vision of you know what are the rules of the game and how we can move forward, and that will only make reconciliation. But uh, on, on the Jordanian issue, I mean, the consultation Consultations, uh, especially with Arab brethren, so between President Abbas and, and Prince of Jordan or the, uh, the leadership in Egypt, I mean, this is an, a, a daily thing. I mean, we realize that this kind, especially the closeness to Jordan, is extremely important. Uh, it doesn't mean that we agree every step because the consultations are going on. Ah, it's not the end. Hind. 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 I, uh, okay, anyhow, they, <laughs> I'm sorry. I uh, will just will make this last comment on, the, uh, on Obama and, and the team. Uh, I will speak in general terms. Uh, basically, uh, Obama is not the only president who made a promise that he couldn't fulfill uh, to the Palestinians. I remember April 2002, Bush made, uh, President Bush made a very uh, good speech on the two-state solution, only to see him two months down the line almost putting, shelving the issue. So this is not new, and I feel uh, over my lifetime um, during the occupation, I was 13 in 1967, we have only been hostages of American internal politics or Israeli internal politics, waiting for the elections either here or there. And I don't think this is something that cannot continue anymore. And, and on the team, I'm, I'm surprised because it's surprising that they come to dictate. Uh, they're not explaining why really we, we should go. It's not very convincing, but also not providing alternatives. This is what diplomacy is about. Uh, if something is not good, then we need to discuss and talk and provide alternatives so that we can move forward. Thank you. Yeah, 
We, sorry. Uh, the gentleman at the back. Thank you. Um, Mike Hanna from Al Jazeera. Oh, Mike. Hi. Um, the issue that has been heard very much among the Palestinian diaspora on this is the question of the right of return. Now, very clearly it appears in all legal opinion is that the move for statehood will produce uh, a state on the borders of 67, Resolution 194, which would have trumped 181 in the first I'm place. sorry, we cannot hear you. But in this particular case, what happens to the right of return? Is the right of return now to a Palestinian state as defined by the 67 borders, or is the right of return a right of return home? Does, by going for this move, the Palestinian leadership not only establish the borders of a Palestinian state, but also the borders, clearly defined borders, of Israel? And what are those ramifications for the right of return? I'm going to bring the mic. Actually, we'll leave. I, I'm going to take. Oh, okay. We're going to take all the remaining questions. We're going to. Oh, sorry, Jonathan. I, I, I just won't have time. Hi, uh, my name's uh, Garrett Nada. I'm a master's student at GW. Uh, I just finished a uh, summer at studying at Birzeit University and also uh, working for a Palestinian NGO in Nambuth, Ramallah, and uh, Kufr Naima. And uh, my question uh, relates uh, to the economy with the impressive growth. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that for a lot of Palestinians that don't live in Ramallah, don't sort of live in this bubble, they haven't really seen the growth at home. They're still high unemployment, and every year more university uh, graduates don't go into the workforce or they go into manual labor, even though they might have a degree in English literature or in IT or something else. So my question goes, I'm really interested to hear from the private sector, um, what are the ramifications for getting anything at the UN for job growth? And um, it seems that there are actually some Palestinians that I met at least were resentful about their leadership, Fayyad and Abbas spending so much time abroad trying to win a battle that might not be able to be won while the situation at home stays the same. So what can the private sector or the, or the public um, do um, uh, in regards to job growth, uh, assuming that the, they get something from the UN? Thank you. And we'll just have the, the last question. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Paola Villa, and I work with the Finnish Broadcasting Company. I'm a journalist. I will pose you a question with I, which was asked me yesterday by one member of the Finnish Parliament. Is there any way you could think that this process of going to the UN and, uh, and um, start to do some actions in advancing your, uh, your position, can it be put on hold anyhow at this time? Or does it look like that you will be now doing something? Thank you so much. Uh, c can this put up, be put on hold, Was I think was the question. Um, okay, so uh, last round of answers and any fi final comments? Uh, Daniel, no, I'll nothing. take yeah. the right, right of return one. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to let... I'll take the... Uh, so I'll, I'll start with you. No. Okay. Thanks. Private sector uh, has played a role and can still play a big role. Yes, there are... Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, opening remarks, 45,000 graduates that are coming out of universities every year. And what uh, the private sector is proposing is to really try to go into the knowledge-based economy. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, you were in Birzeit, so I'll give you an example that is specific to Birzeit. We are a construction company. And uh, in contracting, profit is the motivation. We have managed to find a win-win situation with BS8 University. We have a center of excellence established there that employs 20 graduates, 20 engineers. They're using very high-tech techniques in building information management in construction and engineering. They're getting very good salaries. They are in their line of business. And we are making good profits. This is one example. This can be replicated by a lot of the people in the diaspora once they feel that they are able to do more of this type of activities. This is not just a question of a profit. It has also uh, been spread around the university in a way that, uh, for example, gave Birzeit University graduates, civil, civil engineering graduates, an edge. Uh, last year, when we started recruiting, only four civil engineering graduates from Birzeit made it. 
After having been through an exposure to this program where we have established the center of excellence, which is actually a profit center for us, they, we have managed to recruit 20 out of the 26 uh, university graduates. So basically there are opportunities out there and we will spread this case study to others so that they are encouraged to come in and play bigger roles. There are other things as well. We have to start uh, telling or showing the SMEs as, where as to where uh, good business opportunities exist. There's a big trade imbalance. It's four billion to under a billion in terms of exports, imports and exports. What we have to tell them is look at where there are opportunities for small manufacturing and start producing this internally and we will give you technical assistance. We will give you uh, help in shaping up your business plans and we will uh, also uh, help you in, in enrolling into uh, loan guarantee funds. There's a, there's a big program called the Middle East Investment Initiative out there. I'm on the board. It gives loan guarantees to small and medium enterprises. And uh, we have to find also a means for uh, uh, spreading political risk insurance for the bigger players. So there are a lot of opportunities that will eventually enable the youth to enroll into uh, uh, topics and uh, uh, livings that are very close to their graduates, to their graduation subjects. So there is hope out there. We are very, very optimistic. Thank you. And I, and I want to turn to Heba to, to take a couple of those questions. Yeah, I'll take the last two. On, on the uh, right of return question, um, statehood or going to the UN will, will not prejudice nor bias nor predetermine the final status issues. Those are subject to negotiation still. Uh, that's one factor. The other factor is we really do not know what the language of the resolution will be. We do not know what the, uh, whether the uh, resolution uh, will uh, refer to um, refugees or the borders or to, the, to Jerusalem or set those parameters. And therefore, the, the mere fact in of itself of the bid to the UN will not preclude nor prejudice the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. On the uh, it, this question of putting the decision to go to the UN on hold, uh, <coughs> President Abbas has expressed it uh, on, on a number of occasions. The only um, uh, justification for putting uh, the step to go to the UN on hold would be to have a viable, credible option to resumption of negotiations based on clear uh, parameters as to the issues and a clear timeline. But he, as, a, as, a, as the leader, as the president, uh, will not re-engage in a negotiations for the sake of re-engaging in a process of negotiations. So there has to be clarity, definition, and that would be uh, the uh, only um, exception to going to the UN. Uh, otherwise, I want to hand over. Sorry. I, otherwise, I want to hand over to Layla to uh, make some closing comments and uh, and wrap up. Hello. Yeah. Yep, it's on. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the panelists. Um, this delegation has been in Washington now for three days, and um, have been fielding questions, um, mostly of a skeptical nature. Um, for for those many days, and um, as Zahi said, operating under this this cloud and haze. So I think that they've been very gracious in answering questions, and I think just as much as th they should be questioned, uh, um, those in the U.S. government and um, other members of the international community need to to answer and, and respond to inquiries around how do you actually resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict because ultimately, you know, why we're talking about sort of the procedural moves of going to the UN and um, consequences therefrom, um, this is the Palestinians uh, are in need of 
of freedom and, and justice, and, and this is the cause that, that we need to be um, focused on. Um, and I think that this, this step of, of going to the UN is, is one of many that will um, have to happen in order to, to get to a, to a final um, s situation where, where all of the aspects of, of the conflict have been addressed. I think um, the resolution that would be put to the General Assembly um, would not likely tackle all of these questions and, and would likely be minimalist in its nature because what I've heard from the panelists is ultimately that there's an interest in um, gaining recognition of, of s state status and placing um, this, this struggle into the context of international legitimacy and trying to move the dynamic, political dynamics forward um, and perhaps upset them a bit um, in order to, to change, um, change the situation to, to progress beyond what has been a, a long situation of stalemate. Um, so I want to thank the panelists again for, for their graciousness in answering the questions and um, thank everyone for coming today. And I presume that we will be back here in October for another conversation about <laughs> what, what, what happens next. Thank you. Thank you.